Right. Uh, very good afternoon or morning or evening or night, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar of the uh, of joint webinar, I should say, of EPIC Access and uh, the European Proteomics Association. Um, for this afternoon, uh, your chairs will be uh, myself and uh, my colleague, Harald Barsnes. Um, I will briefly introduce uh, the the EPIC Access Consortium, as well as ÖPA. Uh, and then without further ado, we'll get started with the speakers, which is of course why you're all here. Um, this session is being recorded. So we will make that available afterwards. If you would like to share these talks with other people, that will then be easy to do. Um, we've also had a, a workshop on uh, using IonBot uh, earlier today. And that session has been recorded as well. In case you missed that and you would like to see that, you will be able to see that as well. And we will release that uh, at the same time that we release this, uh, this session recording. So first and foremost, EPIC Access. Um, what is this? Uh, EPIC Access is a European proteomics infrastructure consortium funded by the uh, Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission. And um, the idea is to provide access to proteomics um, analyses. And uh, it consists of a consortium of 18 institutes, which, whom you can see mapped there on the European map. Um, and provide access to our proteomics facilities to all life sciences researchers in the EU. Um, so what does EPIC Access provide? It provides um, protein identification, quantitative analysis, uh, PTM mapping, computational proteomics and training courses and meetings. And of course, you're in one of them right now. Um, the access sites are in 12 different locations uh, in Europe. And the access, if you are interested in obtaining it, is handled by uh, filing a proposal on the EPIC Access website. You see the URL there at the bottom. It's easy, epic-access.eu. And then that proposal will be reviewed by people external to the project, who will then select those proposals that will go forward to actually getting uh, analyzed. One of the other things that EPIC Access does, by the way, is do some research. Um, and these research activities are focused on improving the service provision. And today, the speakers have all been selected from the project, and we'll talk a little bit about the research that they have been doing in EPIC Access to advance the capabilities of proteomics informatics. Um, so that's another aspect of EPIC Access. Then uh, what is ÖPA? ÖPA is the European Proteomics Association. Um, um, I am actually the president of the European Proteomics Association. Um, and uh, my name's, uh, so my, I am Lanach Marsis, by the way, because it says Young Proteomics Investigators Club under my name. That's because we're using the ÖPA uh, YPIC license for this webinar. Um, and uh, the European Proteomics Association brings together all proteomics scientists in Europe, and it has several components, if you like, uh, initiatives and, and, and uh, working groups. But I've highlighted the two that are probably most relevant for today, which is first and foremost, the European Bioinformatics Club, which is UBIC. Um, and that's our bioinformatics initiative. It's a very open group that you can join very easily. Uh, if you Google UBIC uh, and bioinformatics or proteomics, you'll find them immediately. And it's, uh, it's a really nice group to be a part of, and they're very active. And uh, I warmly recommend you to seek them out and to contribute. And then there's also YPIC, that's the Young Proteomics Investigators Club. I see also my label. And uh, this is our early career researcher group, uh, which is also extremely active, extremely open, and always happy to accommodate anybody who wishes to contribute to ÖPA, to the community, and to do some fun stuff together. Um, if you would like to know more about ÖPA, I position there the URL of ÖPA. It currently is still a very old fashioned looking 90s website. We will very soon upgrade that drastically. So if you want to see the retro version, you still have a short period of time in which you can go and look at it. But afterwards, it will be up to date. So don't hesitate to go there and be awed by our not so very beautiful website right now, but soon to be better. Um, Epic Access organizes other um, webinars as well. And so you can see a list of upcoming ones here. Uh, note that all times are in uh, European Central Times. Uh, so we've got one coming up on 19th of May uh, about proteomics and genomics integration on September 8th, which is top-down proteomics, which is also the topic of our first talk today. Whoops, that went fast. And then on the 3rd of November, there is one on plasma proteomics, uh, an evergreen topic in our field. 
And then finally, we have a live workshop, an in-person workshop uh, from 26 to 28 of September about new and advanced proteomics technologies, which is open to anyone interested. It will be in Tartu in Estonia. Um, and uh, the registration will be handled through the Epic Access website at the events page, uh, very much like this one, of course, you already know. And it has been organized by the University of Cambridge together with the University of Tartu. And you can see a very nice picture of Tartu below. And we look forward to welcoming anyone interested there to hear more about what Epic Access is doing and uh, all of the research that is happening within Epic Access, which, to be quite honest, is expansive and interesting. So with that, I think we are done with the introduction, and I will uh, give the word to my colleague Harald, who will chair the first session. The one thing I still need to tell you, though, sorry, Harald, the one thing I still need to tell you is during the presentations, we will collect all the questions in the chat. And um, at the end of the two talks in the first session, we will handle the questions for both uh, speakers. In order to identify which question your, uh, sorry, which speaker your question is addressed to, we do ask you to provide an at and then the first name of the speaker. You can of course see it in their label, so that we know whom you're asking the question to. And then if we have too many questions in the chat to answer during the presentation or right after the presentation, then it's easy for the speakers to find the questions addressed to them, and they will rep rep uh, reply to you in the chat afterwards as well. Okay, so don't forget to put the at and then the first name of the speaker you, went to, you wish to ask the question of. And now I will shut up and let Harald uh, take over. Thank you, Lanat. Yeah, so there's two sessions. The first session um, is on the topic of a deeper look at the proteome at the smallest and largest scale. And as Lanat mentioned, we have two speakers, uh, both giving half an hour uh, presentations. And the first speaker is uh, Kaiwan from uh, Oliver uh, Kohlbacher's group. He's a postdoc there. And his talk will be on bioinformatics advances for top down intact proteomics. So please go ahead, Kaiwan. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kiwan Zhang. As introduced, I'm a postdoc in Korbacher Lab in the University of Tübingen in Germany. I, I find today's seminar is about computational proteomics, and I believe we have lots of breakthroughs in bottom up proteomics, which will be covered in the following great talks. But in this talk, I would like to present some of exciting advances in top-down proteomics. Okay, wait, why I see this? Okay, sorry. Okay, let me quickly review top-down proteomics as compared with bottom-up proteomics. So this sausage link illustrates an intact protein molecule and each sausage a peptide. Kaiwan, yeah. I think you stopped your screen sharing. Oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah, now it's back. Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, now you see the sausage, right? <clears throat> okay, yes. great. In conventional bottom up proteomics, uh, oh, why is this like this? Okay, okay. sorry. <clears throat> In conventional bottom proteomics, the protein is digested into short peptides, and from each peptide, MS2 spectrum is generated, right, one by one, like this. On the other hand, in top down proteomics or TDP, uh, intact protein is analyzed as is without digestion. Top down proteomics is therefore suitable to study proteoforms, um, and proteoforms are the different forms of protein produced from a gene with generic variations or post or co-translational co modifications. Oh, sorry. Since proteoforms provide higher resolution and phenotype closer information than proteins, uh, they are gaining more attention in medical and clinical researches. For us computational proteomics people, the major hurdle in top-down or intact protein data analysis is the complex signal structure of proteoform ions. Uh, let's begin with peptide ion signals first. Uh, due to relatively small masses, peptide ions often have small charge ranges, and also they usually come with small numbers of isotopes. But in case of proteoforms, they generally have wide charge ranges and many isotopes. So a single kind of proteoform ion results in more than 100 peaks in spectrum. This illustration shows only three charge states, but we often observed more than tens of charges from a single kind of proteoform. 
then how this distinctive nature of proteoform ion complicates data analysis. Assume the LC features of the same color here represent the features from the same proteoforms. They often coilute and have very close MZ values each other. And in real spectra, uh, there is certainly no color and it is very hard to distinguish which features are from the same analyte. When we see a specific MS1 full scan, the peaks are often very dense and redundant. MS2 spectrum from these highly charged precursors is also quite complex and retains many peaks of different charge states. These complexities in different levels complicate various proteoform analysis, including identification and quantification. Then how to resolve this complexity? Uh, for example, could we make these entangled features into simple monoisotopic mass features? And could we convert this complex MS1 spectrum into simple one consisting of monoisotopic mass peaks and also for this MS2? This, this entangling step is called mass convolution and this convolution step is very crucial for most MS data analysis in top-down in tech. Because the next step anal analysis like proteoform identification, quantification, predict that errors in the convolution are to be propagated in the following analysis, uh, which I will discuss in the later part of this talk a little bit more. And many excellent convolution tools have been introduced in the last decades. This list only shows a few of many such tools. Thresh is, to the best of my knowledge, the first automated mass convolution tool. It is published almost 20 years ago, but it has been continuously improved, re-implemented, and used widely in many top-down software suites. Extract is also widely used in many top-down software suites like Prosite PCPD, and works well for isotopically resolved high resolution spectra, while respect is optimized for isotopically unresolved spectra. TopFD is a convolution tool in topic software suite that works especially well for the convolution of MS2 spectra. Promex is a feature level convolution tool used within MS Pathfinder T from PNNL. Unidec is also getting lots of popularity, especially in analysis of native MS or CDMS datasets. Also, many other vendor convolution tools have been introduced. They all come with their own strengths and specific applications and also certainly with limits. One of the major limits in deconvolution was the running time. Deconvolution itself often takes much more time than, for example, uh, identification. And to reduce the running time, many tools reduce the range of possible mass range or charge that lead to reduced sensitivity. To address such problems, we introduced flash deconv on ultra fast um, feature and mass convolution tool as a part of OpenMS software. Flash deconv is based on a simple pre processing of spectra to accelerate the decharging step and showed not only very fast, but also accurate convolution results. The speed up of flash deconv is done in decharging step for which we use the simple log MG transformation. We come back to this signal illustration and decharging is to determine charge states of peaks. It can be done by measuring distance between consecutive isotopes or by measuring distance between consecutive charges. Plasticon basically take the second method. If we calculate the distance between consecutive charges, they are given by these blue formulas. Obviously the distance is dependent on the mass value M. When there are multiple masses, we have different charge patterns, which usually complicates the efficient charge determination of peaks and in turn efficient deconvolution. But if we simply take the log to all MZ of all peaks, then the distance between consecutive charges uh, suddenly become independent of the mass value. There is no M in the formula, right? And their charge pattern is the same for different masses. So charge determination becomes a simple and very fast pattern finding in this log MZ transformed spectrum. Thanks to this trick, FlexCom showed orders of magnitude faster on time than other commercial softwares like Extract or Respect. The left side compared the runtimes from different convolution tools for a complex mouse sample. FlexCom took only seven minutes to analyze the whole data set. 
for both MS1 and MS2, uh, it typically achieves less than 20 millisecond processing time per spectrum. And also FlexiConf output far fewer mass artifacts than others, as shown in the right side. Uh, the blue bars represent genuine messes and other bars represent messes interpreted as artifacts. Convolution is certainly still the most important problem in top-down or intact MS data processing, but we also have different problems as in bottom-up. From the deconvolved features, proteoform quantification problem should be solved. And using deconvolved MS1 spectra, more advanced data acquisition scheme could be deployed. And with deconvolved MS1 and MS2, proteoform ID and characterization method could be developed. Let me briefly go through each problem one by one. While feature level uh, label-free quantification allows for accurate and experimentally simple quantification of proteoforms, not many dedicated quantification tools are found. We have a commercial software, ProSite PC uh, in Protein Discoverer, PCPD, to support label-free quantification. And a free software called ITOPQ is presented a few years ago, but it has not been maintained after publication. So we recently developed FlexDecom Q, an open source tool for proteoform label, uh, proteoform label free quantification. FlexDecom Q takes four steps for quantification. It starts with detection of individual ion chromatograms from peaks in centroided MS1 dataset. Using FlexDecom, detected ion chromatograms from the same mass are grouped, and then the coiluted chromatograms are resolved by solving a simple least square problem. And lastly, the quantities of masses are calculated by summing up the area of the grouped resolved chromatograms. Let's look a little bit closer. Assume there are two proteoform uh, chromatograms color coded with green and orange. The red chromatogram is the overlapping one. Flexcom uh, Q takes the non overlapping chromatograms and from them generates theoretical shapes. And with these shapes, the overlapping red chromatogram is reconstructed by solving a non-negative least square problem. This shows an actual observed signal from an E. coli lysate dataset. Green and orange features are from different proteoforms, and the red one is overlapping one. And the right side shows how Fresco Q resolved collusion. And this resolving step gives an accurate quantity ratio as well. When we benchmarked flexicon of Q against just flexicon respect and ITOP Q with E. coli lysate, we observed flexicon Q found the most jointly detected proteoforms and also showed high portion of overlap. And most importantly, we looked at the quantification accuracy. The green boxes show the coefficient of variation or CV values of low abundance masses, and orange boxes are the CV values of high abundance. For both cases, FlexCom Q showed minimum CV values, showing FlexCom Q is accurate and also works well for low abundance proteoforms. And next, data acquisition is also an important issue in top-down proteomics. Just think about uh, a simple DDA acquisition in this MS1 spectrum. As shown before, red and green peaks represent the same proteoforms respectively. For instance, if we choose the most intense four peaks for fragmentation, they are the selected precursors and they are all from the same proteoform. Different from the bottom of cases, this criteria often ends up with the selection of redundant and often low quality precursors. To tackle this problem, intelligent data acquisition methods like autopilot and meta drive have been presented. Autopilot performs real-time convolution and identification to optimize precursor selection, and MetaDrive performs real-time convolution to select multiple precursors for fragmentation to boost quality of MS2 spectra. But both methods were limited by rather long processing time. They should be fit in the duty cycle of the instruments. By leveraging fast convolution of flash decomp, we developed flash IDA, an intelligent data acquisition scheme to boost proteoform ID sensitivity. Uh, Flexiconf runs inside of the thermal machines real time. Um, so the MS1 spectrum here, this red arrow is provided by thermal IAPI real time to, uh, to Flexiconf that performs 
real-time deconvolution. Then the deconvolved spectrum is further processed and converted to mass quality spectrum from which high quality masses are selected. The selected masses are converted back to MZ and fed back to machine again through IAPI. Flexi IDA avoids coiluted precursors and controls isolation window size uh, real time to select high quality precursors. With this relatively simple workflow, we were able to make a large boost in terms of the number of proteoform identifications. We compared flash IDA runs, FI datasets, against standard DDA runs, ST datasets from E. coli lysate single runs. The latter digits 30 and 90 specify the retention time gradients. In the bar graph, uh, bluish bars are from flash IDA and red-ish bars are from standard DDA acquisition. Flash IDA resulted in almost twice proteoforms for the same retention time gradient runs, or alternatively, it achieved similar proteoform count uh, to standard acquisition with about a third of the instrument time. Next topic is the identification. We have actually many excellent softwares for proteoform identification. Very popular tools like Prosite PCPD and Topic, they are widely used and actively maintained. We also have PTOP and MS Pathfinder T. While they are uh, less actively maintained, they provide sensitive and complementary proteoform identification to Prosite PD and Topic. Uh, Professor David Tapp is preparing a paper on the comparative study of top-down proteomic softwares with us. And this diagram shows the analysis flow, where different ID tools, identification tools, are evaluated for the same samples. Please wait for this informative paper in which the detailed analysis about these tools will be provided. Now, given these brilliant tools, the question is, should we go with another one? Should we develop another one? Well, let me give you some explanation on why we may need one. Another analysis we are performing with DevTap uh, in the paper is to compare different deconvolution softwares. We use a single ID tool, which is topic in the bottom side, and use different deconvolution algorithms. Let me present a simple proteoform ID overlap analysis, which will lead to an unexpected surprise on proteoform FDR estimation. And this may convince you the need of another identification tool or at least another host processor for proper FDR control. Uh, let's say two proteins, not proteoforms, uh, from two different runs overlap if their protein oxidations are the same. It's pretty simple. And two proteoforms overlap if their protein oxidations are the same, sequences are the same, and precursor masses are the same. I rarely saw the case where the first and the third conditions are met, but the second is not met. So the most decisive factors are the protein oxidations and precursor mass. The evaluation metric was simply the overlap coefficient. Uh, from this Venn diagram, the overlap coefficient is the number of intersecting elements divided by the smaller cell size of the two. When it is 0%, no overlap is observed. And when it is 100%, then we have a perfect overlap. To compare the convolution tools, I minimize the variance from sample or ID identification tools. From the same E. coli orbitrap sample, we used flash deconf and extract for the convolution and coupled with the same identification tool topic at proteoform level FDR of 1%. And we saw how their overlap coefficient changes. In protein level, we have 92% of overlap. Well, not so very bad. And for proteoform level, oh, it was quite low, it's 51%. This doesn't look very good. Well, but maybe this is the case in which flash deconf and extract are complementary each other. So maybe a win-win game. Then I removed this variance again by only taking the proteoforms from the same MS2 spectrum. They should be the same because they are from the same MS2. In protein level, it was 96%, a bit too low. I wish I had 99% or 98% because FDR is only 1%. Then how about the proteoform level? It was only 49%, even lower than before. 
So this explicitly shows the precursor masses from two masses do not match seriously, which may be a very serious problem for both flash decomp and extract. But what is even worse is that this shows is that proteoform level FDR is failing so, so bad. Okay, then how about we introduce precursor error intentionally? I took only flash deconf and designed this following analysis. For this typical deconvolution ID pipeline, I added a devil block in which arbitrarily masses between 10 and 20 are added to or subtracted from the deconvolved precursor masses. For example, when the reported precursor masses are here, some random masses are added or subtracted and it is used for the, used for the topic identification of 1% FDR. For this search, the number of proteoform uh, spectrum matches reduced only by 10%, not by 9%. And even worse, the number of proteoforms increased by 200%. This is kind of expected because all different random force precursor masses will be interpreted as novel proteoforms. So one can guess that most force particles in TDP searches are from precursor mass errors. This gets serious, especially when blind modifications are allowed. And when many modifications are allowed per proteoform identification, the same problem occurs. Then why our great target decoy database cannot control this source of error? A simple way to see if decoy works is to compare score distributions of decoy hits and actual false positives. To obtain false positives, we search this E. coli data set against human protein database. This is FP1, this simulate the protein sequence error. And we took the first pi tips with the incorrect precursor masses from the previous devil block pipeline. This is FP2. And lastly, we have decoy hits from decoy only database search. This is the match score distribution of decoy hits, the higher, the better. And the second shows the distribution from FP1. They are quite similar. So decoy will represent false parties in, the, in FP1, in other words, in other words uh, protein sequence error. And this one shows the distribution from FP2. If we see the x-axis scale, we can easily see decoy and FP2 have very different distribution. Not only this shows decoy cannot simulate false parties from precosmos error, but also indicates that square cutoffs that do not take precursor convolution quality into account would have the same issue. Then what is the solution? We are trying to uh, trying the approach similar to uh, the tool condenser from Lucas Kell group, uh, which used the notion of decoy MS1 features to control MS1 feature match error rate. By using decoy MS1 features with percolator, they showed less than 5% feature level FDL. Likewise, we could extract features from precursor convolution and use decoy precursor methods with percolator. This is an ongoing project in our group. So far, we thought about how to take precursor mass error into account for accurate FDR estimation in identification. Another way to resolve this FDR issue is just to remove all precursor mass errors. Again, going back to the first deconvolution problem. Uh, this is too dreamy, but we are trying to improve the convolution quality using deep learning to reduce uh, and hopefully remove the convolution errors. To measure the convolution quality using deep learning, we encode the observed peaks so that they can be used in RNN and CNN based classifiers. Let's revisit this signal from the proteome. And these peaks of different charges will be moved to this three dimensional space with mass charge and intensity axis. The first blue peak can be moved like this. The first peak comes to here, uh, corresponding to monostopic mass, and others come one by one. And the next charged peaks appear in the next charge axis, and the purple peaks appear in the next charge. Now we encode these peaks into a sequence of tokens. The blue peaks from the first, uh, blue peaks uh, form the first token, and the second uh, green peaks make the second token, and the last purple make the third token. Note that the, the tokens contain similar signal shapes. 
When the signal changes, for example, their isotope patterns change and have more charge states, we have more tokens with different uh, signal shapes. For very small masses, the sequence lengths will become very short. Lastly, for noise, we usually have very low relation between tokens. So overall, the inputs have variable lengths and signal has high relation between tokens and noise has low relation. So RNN might work very well for these kind of inputs. The second method to see this signal is to simply see it from above. Then the signal look like this, it has a checkerboard pattern. If the signal changes, we have differently sized checkerboard. And for smaller one, we have very small checkerboard. Lastly, noise make rather scattered dots. So overall target image size varies. Signal and noise have different patterns. So CNN looks a good method for this problem. Uh, CNN is already used for deconvolution in uh, topic suite as well with the name ENV CNN scoring. For training, validation and test, we prepared half simulated data sets. We have three classes instead of two. Uh, correct class messes are obtained by collecting deconvolved MS1 messes of very high signal to noise ratio. The noise messes are obtained by shifting the signals in correct messes by 10 Thompsons in the row spectrum. Lastly, we also have mass artifact class that represents charge assignment errors. Oops. This is the RNN result. We use three different RNN models, simple RNN, LSTM, and GRU. When you ran three times with different sets, uh, all showed very high accuracy, exceeding 0.95. LSTM showed the best performance and GRU followed the next. One interesting observation is that RNN works much better for larger masses. This makes sense because larger masses often ha have uh, longer input sequences and RNN can effectively exploit information in long input sequences. Then we tested with simple CNN model. Uh, for CNN, we tested with two maximum charge ranges of 10 and 50. And the results from CNN were actually better than uh, RNN. The average accuracy was almost 0.97 when 50 charges were used. CNN also worked better with more charge states, but the difference between narrow and wide charge ranges were not that high. And we also tried to take advantage of other people's work. One relatively easy way to do so is to use so-called transfer learning technique. We took an architecture called ResNet which has been trained to classify pictures in ImageNet. ImageNet is a huge image database retaining, uh, retaining more than 14 million images. We took this ResNet and trained it with our training data set uh, with fine tuning of architecture. When we evaluated, evaluated the performance as compared with simple CNN, we always observed a small amount of performance boost in every single test. This shows that pre-trained architectures like ResNet can help to improve the convolution quality filtering because their ability to detect, detect elementary shapes are very advanced. Even though this is still a preliminary result, we are quite excited to see that the information in the picture of, for example, what cats and dogs actually could boost the MS data analysis. If we could do with no more pictures, then for instance, we could use information in bottom-up uh, for top-down we pre-train using abundant bottom-up data for simple tests and use transfer learning for top-down where we suffer from lack of data. This is my hope. And here we show a few examples of correctly classified messages. They are all precursor messages convolved by top FD and identified by top peak. Blue bars are correctly positioned peaks and red are incorrectly positioned peaks. Picks are binned and intensities within each bin are summed. The blue bars form nice isotope pattern shapes. And they are the noise class masses. We see lots of red peaks, noise peaks, and blue peaks do not form good shapes. Note that they are still identified precursor masses at 1% FDR by top FD and top peak. And this is another noise class picks. This looks a very perfect shape, so it looks like a misclassification. But we found that this is actually mislocated peaks by two Daltons. So 
we observed that deep learning can even find small monoistopicness errors quite easily. And lastly, we revisit this overlap analysis uh, from previous one. Uh, the proteoform level overlap coefficient for the same MS2 spectra was only nine, uh, 49%. We post-process the precursors using our deep learning filter. Then we had 82% proteoform overlap. This is very nice. But we also lost 18% of overlapping proteoforms. But when uh, considering 72% from extract and 48% from flash decon proteoforms were filtered out, this result still looks not so bad. So to sum up, in top-down area, many softwares and tools have been introduced for different aspects of data analysis. Not just single tools, we have commercial and free software suites for more comprehensive analysis of top-down data, including ProSide PC, PD, Topic Suite, and Mesh Explorer, and Metamorphous. We contributed with our recently developed flash series tools, and hopefully in the near future, we could release our flash software suite as well. With that, I would like to thank to my colleagues in Kolbaha Lab and all the collaborators. I also thank to all the funding resources and deeply thank to the audience for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, and I will gladly take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiwan. Mm -hmm. So as Lanat mentioned, uh, we'll do the questions at the end of both um, sure. talks in this first mm -hmm. session. Uh, but I will urge anybody who has a question to put it in the chat now before you forget your question. Um, and now we've looked at the uh, large scale. So now we looked at intact proteins. Now we'll move on to the smaller scale of uh, immunopeptidomics. And we'll have a talk by Arthur from who's a PhD in Lanat Martin's group. who will talk to us about MS2 rescore for improved immunopeptidomics. So Arthur, when you're ready, just go ahead. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to pick my pointer before we start. So hello, everyone. My name is Arthur. I'm a PhD student at the Compomics Lab. And today I will talk about MS2 Rescore and its application into uh, immunopeptide identification and how we can get much more out of the immunopeptide identification by using uh, machine learning and deep learning tools. So to give you guys a quick overview of what I am going to talk about today. First of all, I'm going to start off with the specific challenges in immunopeptics, immunopeptidomics, so we know why we need um, new tools to uh, raise the identifications in immunopeptidomics. I will talk about leveraging the peak intensity predictions and the, deep, um, and the retention time predictions from ms 2 pip and DeepLC and how we use that in ms 2 rescore then we'll show the applications of MS2 Rescore and its dramatic improvements in immunopeptidomics. We'll go into a more detailed analysis of the effects of MS2 Rescore and we'll uh, finish off with some generic peptidomic applications. So to start off, the specific challenges in immunopeptidomics, what do we want to do in immunopeptidomics is identify immunopeptides that are presented on the uh, MHE-bound molecules. And these are these peptides here presented in the slide. Uh, and so first of all, we extract the um, MHC molecules with the peptide still uh, attached. Uh, and then we elute these peptides and we um, measure these peptides in the mass spectrometry. But uh, when we try to identify these peptides um, with uh, standard search engines, we have to take into account that these peptides are uh, basically non-triptych. So previously, normally what we do is a triptych digest, and so we end up with only trip uh, uh, triptych peptides in our search space. Now, immunopeptides are basically non-specific or non-triptych. Furthermore, we have to take into account the variable length of these peptides. If you take a look at um, HLA class one immunopeptides, these uh, vary, these lengths range from eight amino acids to 12 amino acids. But if you take a look to HLA two peptides, these uh, ranges get much bigger from 12 to um, 26. Uh, and to give you an example of what this does to the search space is normally if you take a uh, protein with 1,000 amino acids, and we do a triptych digest, we get about 115 triptych peptides in our search space. Um, if we do a non-specific digestion of our search space, so in this case of the 1,000 amino acid protein, we'll end up with 991 non-triptych peptides, and this is only for uh, one specific length. So uh, amino acids 
peptides of um, nine amino acids. And if we then uh, adjust for the variable length that we have in immunopeptides, so we're at uh, eight to 12 amino acids, we'll end up with uh, a surge base of five, 15,000 uh, peptides. And so if we would do this for the HLA class two peptides, it would get even uh, bigger. And the results of this increased um, surge base is that we ultimately end up with less confident matches of our uh, peptides against our spectrum that we measured with the LCMS. And so ultimately, with the FDR control, we lose a lot of our identifications. Um, and so uh, with basic or standard search engines, we end up with a lot less identifications uh, or BSM matches in the end. So now, how do we want to uh, improve the identification rate in immunopeptidomics? Well, we will use the machine learning and deep learning tools that are presented in the workshop previously uh, called MS2PIP and DeepLC to provide um, peak intensity predictions and retention time predictions. And so what does MS2 rescore? MS2 rescore is a, a post-processing tool, which is very important. This uses all of the peptide spectrum matches from the search engine that you use. And then we'll calculate three sets of different features for uh, all of the PSNs. First of all, the search engine features, uh, these are the standard features that the search engine also uses to score PSMs. And we'll additionally add deep LC features based on retention time, retention time predictions. So this is, for instance, the retention time error. And then we'll also add um, peak intensity predictions from ms 2 pit and uh, calculate a whole range of um, different features for that as well. And then we provide all of these features to percolate to essentially rescore the PSMs that we have identified uh, in our search space to ultimately end up with a lot more of identifications. Um, but before we were able to do that for immunopathidomics, we essentially had to retrain um, ms 2 pip specifically for non-triptic peptides. We saw that DPLC was quite robust to predict the retention times for uh, non-triptic peptides. But uh, for ms 2 pip and in the case of uh, peak intensity predictions, we saw that non-triptic peptides heavily altered the peak intensities. So we had to train a new model that basically got much better at uh, predicting these non-triptic peptides. And as you can see here, uh, these are all the models that we have trained uh, and tested. Uh, in the yellow one, you see the uh, current triptych model of ms 2 pip And then you can see that the newly trained models uh, do a very do a much better job at predicting um, peak intensities for HLA one and HLA two data. What was more striking is that by providing um, immunopeptides to the training set, we also increased the identification uh, the Pearson correlations for the predictions between the observed and the predicted um, peak intensities for the triptic data as well which was quite um, satisfaction, satisfying to see that actually we had models that were uh, able to generalize the predictions for both triptic and non-triptic peptides much better. In the end, we also uh, tried this on the chymotrips in digested data. And what we saw there is that the model that was trained on solely immunopeptides, immunopeptides was not good at predicting the retention time, uh, the peak intensities for um, chymotrips in digested data. So we had to actually provide chymotrips and digested data to the training data before we were able to predict uh, peak intensities for chymotrips in data very well. And this shows that even though immunopeptides are non-triptic in essence, um, it, there still is a quite uh, big difference between chymotrypsin, which is also considered a non uh, to generate non-triptic peptides. So there's still a, a big difference between these non-triptic peptides. And so uh, we provided all of these features, like I mentioned before, in MS2 rescore to percolator. And then we see that all of these features in blue, uh, we have highlighted the MS2 PIP features, in green, the deep LC features, and then in yellow, the search engine features. And we can see that all of these features get quite a big of weight. The reason why we have so much MS2 PIP features is because MS2 PIP calculates much more data points, which, uh, from which we can calculate much more features. Uh, but as you can see here, while retention type predictions is only one data point, so we can um, match the predicted retention time with the observed retention time, we can see that this is a very important feature when rescoring um, the data. And what, uh, what was also very nice to see is um, when we rescore HLA 
class one peptides, which are fairly restricted in the length, you can see that also the peptide length is a huge, a very important feature for percolator in rescoring the data, which is uh, actually very nice to see. And if we take a little bit more uh, in-depth look on how um, percolator uses these features, is here we can see, so on the uh, left side, we see the search engine score in relation to the retention time error. Here we see the search engine score in relation to the Pearson correlation. And here we see the uh, retention time error with the Pearson correlations. And so what we see here is that by providing all of these different features, and so uh, keep in mind that these are also only three features, but we have in total around 100 features that we provide to Percolate. Percolator is really able to separate the accepted target from the um, from the rejected targets. Um, and if you take a, a little bit more look in the center view, um, previously, if you would only use the search engine score, and we would tell that above a certain threshold, we would uh, take these targets as accepted targets, we would have taken a lot of invalid target split. So now when we provide the Pearson correlation co uh, coefficient, we can see that we can very much we can much better separate the accepted from the rejected targets. And if you take a more uh, a look at the uh, distributions um, from the decoys, the rejected targets and the accepted targets, then you can nicely see that the distributions of the decoys very well match the distribution of the rejected targets, while we can see a huge difference for the accepted targets. And this is for the retention time error and the fusion correlations. And this shows very well why uh, it is such an advantage to prevent to provide these features to percolator for rescoring because it is able to very nicely separate your uh, targets. Now to show you some of the results that we got from um, MS2 rescore and uh, post-processing immunopapillomics data. Here you can see on the uh, left hand or on the y-axis uh, the identifications so of the higher we go, the more identifications we have of the more identified spectrum and the much more, if you go more to the left, then we have a much higher FDR threshold that we use. Um, so if you take a look at the 1% FDR, if you compare MS2 rescore with uh, standard uh, percolator, so uh, rescoring with only search engine features, then we can see that for the 1% FDR, MS2 rescore has a um, very nice increase in the number of identified spectra which was very nice to see uh, actually but then if you take a look at the 0.1 percent fdr previously even with rescoring with only search and new features we were not able to get that much of identifications um, out of uh, your data well now we have a huge increase in the confidence that we have in the matches and also a huge increase in the number of identified spectra and if you can if you take a look at the where we are here at the um, uh, 0.1 FDR, nearly 80% of the peptides that were identified at 1% FDR were already identified at the 0.1% FDR, which is quite a, a nice sight to see. And then if you take a look at the um, uniquely identified peptides, which is the most important thing in immunopeptidomics because you want to find these new immunopeptides uh, in terms of sequence. And again, we can see if we um, take a comparison with only search engine uh, rescoring, so only using search engine features uh, and standard rescoring, that we can get a very nice increase of around 40% uh, in uniquely identified peptides at 1% FDR, but we nearly get a 300% increase in identified peptides at the 0.1 FDR. So really we increase the specificity that we have in the samples and identify a lot more in the data. So now we provide the opportunity to not only have more identifications at the 1% FDR, but also to use the 0.1% FDR if you want to be more sure of the identifications that you have. Um, and then to take a look at uh, what the gained peptides look like. So in immunopeptidomics for the certain HLA pattern, we really uh, certain HLA type, we really see certain patterns um, in the data and uniquely identified peptides. And so on the left hand side, this was the pattern that was identified in a previous paper for the C1203 HLA type. 
And when we look at the peptides that we gained by MS2 B score, so only the peptides that MS2 B score identified uh, in relation to search engine rescoring, we see that this pattern is nicely represented uh, by all of the gained peptides. And when we take a look at the lost peptides, so the peptides that MS2 B score um, tosses away, we can see that um, these are essentially um, much more random patterns that are uh, explained here. We can also see that the information, the, so the bits in these uh, patterns are much lower. So essentially what we throw away is more likely to be false positives and we gain a lot of nicely um, uh, peptides that really fit the, the HLA pattern. And then we also did this for the state of the art search engine, which speaks for immunopeptidomics. Um, and then again, we can see that also here we had a nice increase in identifications for the 1% FDR, although slightly lower than, for instance, when we rescored max quant data. Uh, and this is because PEAKS is much more suited for immunopeptidomics. But then when we take a look at the 0.1% FDR, we uh, again see a uh, very nice increase, twofold increase in the number of identifications that we had um, before rescoring. So rescoring really can get a lot out of your data. Uh, and to show you a little bit more of what MS2 Rescore is capable of, uh, and not in terms of identifications, but we can really see that for all of the HLA patterns, MS2 Rescore is able to um, have uh, constant improvements uh, of the identification rate. But what is very nice to see is that for, for HLA patterns that previously we did not have any identifications for, for instance, uh, this one at the bottom here, um, in blue you see the uh, low rescoring. So this is basically what's come, what comes out of the search engine. We can see that by applying MS2 rescore, we nearly get a 10% identification rate at the zero uh, at the one percent FDR, where we previously didn't have any identifications at all. So even for the harder to identify HLA patterns, we can now really start to map the um, HLA patterns and try to get um, and, and better overview of the HLA patterns that are in there. Um, and we did the same for a different collision energy. So we split up the identification rates and the gains of MS2 rescore by different collision energies. Uh, and so what we saw is that the, the overall identification rate dropped when we use suboptimal collision energy values, which is in this case 35 for immunopeptidomics. Uh, but we can see that the gain of uh, using MS2 rescore is here the biggest, nearly 60%. Uh, and this is uh, a little bit explained better on the bottom left here. So by using higher collision energies, we get a very, we get a lower explained volume current, which means that our spectra in, in a sense gets a little bit worse. And uh, MS2 rescore accounts for this. So MS2 rescore really learns that the spectra at this, uh, with a collision energy of 35 is getting less and less accurate by shifting its weight more and more to the deep LC feature. So we can see that the weights of the deep LC features here in green are getting much bigger. So the by shifting its weight, uh, MS2 Rescore can still get a lot out of your data, even though the um, the, the circumstances were suboptimal in this case, uh, for instance, for the collision energy values. And this is a really nice way of recovering a lot of data that we previously have been lost. And um, the same is true for um, abundance. So we did, uh, we took a look at the, the peak intensities of the MS1 spectrum, um, and we divided this in 10 bins. And so for the, the um, the identifications with the high MS1 precursor intensities, uh, the gains were not really that big. Uh, although we had some you know, some nice gains, um, the biggest gains were actually seen for the low abundant peptides, peptides that were previously would have not been identified by your search engine. And so here again, we can see that we can recover a lot of the data, a lot of the identifications that previously would have been lost due to this uh, low abundant uh, precursor MS1 spectrum. And so uh, MS2 Rescore can really identify or recover these peptides as well out of the data and have a huge gain in these suboptimal uh, ranges of um, yeah, any suboptimal sub circumstances uh, in say. And then to final, to my final um, 
things about the MSTR score. Uh, MSTR score is not only limited to immunopathy domains with the new models, as I showed you in the beginning. We also trained on chymotrypsin data, which is another non triptych enzyme. Uh, and so we applied MSTR score on uh, genetopathy domains uh, data. And here again, we saw some nice increases in number of identified spectra. Um, for the Arabidopsis thaliana biopeptides, which are also non triptych and even for the human uh, urine peptidome, uh, we still got an increase of uh, 60 or 150 uh, percent for the one PSM. And then, uh, which was the, the most striking result, is that almost 90 percent of the data um, at the 1 percent FDR was already identified at the 0.1 percent. Uh, again, showing that we can gain a huge, um, we have a huge gain of sensitivity and specificity um, by rescoring with um, the peak intensity predictions from ms pip and the retention time predictions from PLC. So to conclude, um, ms rescore can substantially increase the number of identifications uh, in immunopathy domics. Uh, we enable by using ms rescore the, uh, the use of much thicker FDR thresholds. ms rescore can really get the most out of your data, even in suboptimal values, and can recover low abundant peptides as well as um, whenever you have a, a little bit more, a little bit worse spectra. And we, MS3 score is not only limited to immunopathy domics, but we can branch out the peptidomics data as well and have some really nice gains for these uh, data sets as well. And with that, uh, I conclude my talk about MS3 score. And I would like to thank everyone in the group uh, that has helped with the, this, um, this very nice tool. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. You have almost 10 minutes left if there's more you want to say. <laughs> I talked a bit too fast. I, I that's it. okay. That's okay. Um, there are not many questions. So if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the chat. Um, there's one question that's already been answered in the chat, but I think we can repeat it for the people that haven't followed the chat. And that's for Kai Won. It's from Animesh about um, how clean does a sample has to be for flash decon to work? I'm wondering if it can pick up antibodies from serums, serum directly. Well, I, I think this, this can be a question of a dynamic range of data itself. Uh, I mean, if, if there are peaks, maybe Flexicon can pick up the signal or other tools as well. But um, if, if this antibody has just um, so low abundance that the, the, the dynamic range is, exists like 10 to the 5, for example, then there's no way any Convolution tool can pick the signal up, but if that's not the case, maybe we can uh, try. But I don't see, I don't know. Usually, when people analyze antibody, they just have very pure ones, right? So, um, yeah. So, yeah. For, for now, I, I cannot answer that before I actually see the data set. But if if the complexity is about the number of peaks then uh, Flexicon can uh, pick up the signal quite efficiently. Yeah, so that is true. Thank you. And now mm -hmm. there's also a new question here for Arthur. I missed the workshop this afternoon. How do you train the software for immunopeptidomics? Do you use the peptides published in literature? Yes, so we used um, some publicly available data sets on immunopeptides that we used to retrain the ms pip models on. Uh, so we had uh, better uh, peak intensity predictions for immunopeptides. Um, and we also looked at DPLC, so the retention time predictions, uh, which already did quite uh, quite a good job at uh, predicting non triptych peptides. So we did not train, had to train any additional models for uh, DPLC. Um, and then ms rescore is basically just providing all of these features to percolate and then rescoring um, everything that we have. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, anything I missed, Leonard? No. Only people no, saying thank you and good presentation, so that's also good. We are we are way ahead of schedule, though. So um, what do we do now, Leonard? <laughs> I uh, propose that we that we simply continue.
Um, and, uh, I think that is a good idea. On the uh, on the other hand, since we're ahead of schedule and since we've been doing this now for an hour, maybe it's not a bad idea to have a short bio break of about five minutes so that people can uh, can get a drink or can visit the bathroom for a moment. And then um, I propose that we'll be back at 25 past four and then uh, we'll continue. So uh, short break uh, before we continue. <clears throat> so welcome back everyone. Um, we'll continue this, uh, this webinar with the last two presentations, uh, which are actually nicely matched. And uh, they, they talk about uh, the, the large scale, if you like, interpretation and reuse of proteomics data. And so our two speakers are Matthias Wilhelm from the Technical University of Munich and Juan Antonio Vizcaino from uh, Amble EBI. And uh, both uh, will talk about interesting resources uh, and verification of data. And uh, the first of these will be uh, by Matthias. Uh, Matthias, you can start sharing your screen meanwhile. Yeah, super, there we go. And so um, he will talk about Proteomics DB and the, the Prozit tool suite that, uh, that has been developed at the uh, Technical University of Munich and how that uh, both disseminates and probably uses uh, FAIR data in various ways. So Matthias, without further ado, I'll give the word to you. Thank you for the introduction, Hurt. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. So as, as introduced, I'm attempting to talk a bit about um, fair data, how FAIR data fosters proteomic research and sort of try and exemplify this a bit on proteomics DB and Prosit, um, two bigger projects we have been working on over the past years, um, and particularly proteomics DB, I somewhat not necessarily painfully, but it sort of opened my eyes when I, when I made these slides a couple of days ago that the development of Proteomics DBs is by now two years old, essentially. So about two years ago, we started developing Proteomics DB, which is an in-memory database for, for hosting initially just large amounts of proteomics data. And we used it really um, initially as a mechanism to disseminate data we have acquired in the context of figuring out which proteins are likely present in which organ in the human body. Um, since then, in Proteomics DB, plenty of different um, um, research projects happened, and we disseminated different tools and, and analysis with it. So Proteomics DB typically follows sort of two streams, um, one where we focus largely on data processing and dissemination, and the other one where we focus on data integration utilization. And I will go into both aspects throughout this talk now a bit. Briefly, um, ProteomCB started in 2012 um, with this project of figuring out which proteins may um, be in which quantities expressed in which part of the human body. And then um, we developed um, different to a different tool chain um, looking into um, protein FDR, but also into how we can sort of extract the most information out of raw files. And on this side, and that was almost always coupled with um, extensions on data integration and utilization, where we integrated different data streams into Proteomics DB, looking at target spaces of drugs, for example, here on the bottom left-hand side, or also then on how the um, expression patterns of proteins is in other organisms. All of this um, would have not been possible without prior research. And Proteomics DB particularly is built on, on the shoulders of giants here. So without access to fair data and, and fair software in the same in the same um, regard, um, Proteomics DB and similar efforts would have not been possible. Right? So we rely heavily on the ability of um, standards, um, ontologies, um, on annotations, um, largely coupled in, in knowledge bases such as Uniprot, um, Campbell, but also gene ontology, CAC, and String. Um, which we really rely on, on on understanding our proteomics data but we also made a huge um, we benefited hugely from efforts um, from the protein exchange consortium particularly also pride here um, which provides access to i guess in the meantime petabytes of proteomics data and similar efforts sort of in transcriptomics and also phenomics all of this obviously also covered with um, or coupled with the availability of open source software or at least free to use software um, such as MaxQuant, which really sort of um, used heavily for processing data and, and bringing this into proteomics DB. But also accompanied by this um, standards and um, how do we represent peptides, how do we represent um, modifications and so on. 
So without the work of um, many, many um, people in this realm, um, an effort like Potemus DB would have really not been possible. And um, today, Potemus DB sits on a, quite an extensive amount of data because of that. So Potemus DB covers in the range of 300 human tissues, fluids, and, and cell lines. Um, by now, um, we have also extended Potemus DB not, to not only if, um, present data on human origin, but also um, cover about 40 Arabidopsis tissues and cell lines, um, also cover about 40 mouse tissues and cell lines. And soon there's also a rice protein available in protein XDB. Um, we have in the beginning largely focused on sort of the pure um, expression data of proteins across those um, tissues and cell lines and body fluids. But in the meantime, we also store um, other information about proteins. So how do they behave when trying to melt them? So this is in the context of ZETSA experiments. Um, Proteomics DB supports the storage of turnover measurements. So how quickly do proteins get synthesized or degraded in the system? So that's also particularly interesting these days for developing novel drugs such as Protex. We also store a large chunk of those response um, data, so measuring precisely at which concentration of a drug a cell line um, is going to respond or not respond. Um, and obviously then also comes with that is a lot of um, protein expression data and transcript expression data. The database scheme here depicted on the right hand side sort of spun a bit out of control over the last years. And I guess that's a particular challenge also in research projects like this where you start a project like this as a PhD project and it grows and grows over time and then you add a module here and they add a module there and add a new feature there so this so at some point this will require a bit of time to um, homogenize this a bit but you see that in the in the database scheme we are covering quite an extensive um, range of data on problem to be um, Protemis CB um, today is still hosted um, by a group in, at the TU Munich, um, the pro, um, group of Professor Kretschmer. Um, and Protemis CB is run on a um, database um, scheme um, which is developed by um, SAP HANA, or database technology rather. It's an in-memory database. So the, the data we provide access to on Protemis DB comes on or sits in a, in a server which has um, six terabyte of main memory. So there's actually two of these servers by now um, with the continuous integration um, testing behind this or with a couple of development infrastructure um, um, machines behind this and then also an auxiliary compute node allowing us to perform predictions using GPUs or, or CPUs. Um, we've used Proteomics DB um, not only for or largely for disseminating also our own data or data which was acquired in the context of my previous employment at Professor Bernard Küsters chair, um, where um, on top of this data layer there sits a presentation layer where we try and provide access um, to the data in, in useful visualizations for the scientific community. So um, while benefiting from efforts such as Pride to make um, the raw data available, we, we have in the past um, built extensively on top of this layers which allow um, users to investigate these, state, these data in detail, combine data from different streams and sort of validate or come up with new hypotheses for their, for their research. Um, Today, um, Proteomics DB supports um, proteomics data, um, transcriptomics data, um, the phenomics data we, we briefly talked about earlier. We also integrate data from um, target identification measurements, so where experiments are done which are aimed to figure out which drugs interact with which proteins, and then also um, metadata in the form of such, uh, for example, protein-protein um, protein interaction maps. Um, because of that, um, in Proteomics DB, you can essentially explore all of these, um, these data in real time. Um, so you can, for example, start from the expression of a protein here depicted um, with the body map where in the color scheme superimposed, you see where your protein of interest is expressed most or least. And then one can go straight into potential drugs interacting with this protein. One can go also into um, the phenotypic response of cell lines when using those drugs. Um, one can look at expression patterns of multiple proteins in the form of a heat map visualization. One can also look at the target spaces of multiple drugs combined. 
um, but also dig down into the data of, of every single spectrum essentially. Um, to go a bit more in detail what is possible, um, this, um, start with the very um, low level information so we can dig to every single spectrum stored in ProgemisDB essentially. So you have a visualization like this where um, a mirror plot, which you've likely seen in an earlier presentation already, where to the, maybe to the top, at least here to the top, you see an experimental spectrum. On the bottom, you see a reference spectrum. That reference spectrum may originate from, from synthetic peptides, but may also originate from prediction tools. Um, in our case, that originates from POSIT. They can actually look at every single identification and, and try and figure out whether um, the protein you may be interested in is um, confidently supported by an identification of a peptide which uniquely maps to this protein. In ProtomCB, we support the annotation of these spectra for various um, fragmentation techniques and particularly the addition of the reference spectra of which we store in the range of 100 million in ProtomCB um, allows you to, to get also without extensive prior um, experience on how mass spectra should look like, you can get an intuitive feeling on whether this looks to be correctly identified if the top one matches the bottom spectrum. The visualization we use to um, show both proteomics and transcriptomics expression data is um, if you look at one single protein as this body map which, um, as mentioned earlier, superimposes the uh, um, expression information on a body map um, using a color scheme indicating in which tissue or um, which cell line, which is then mapped to its um, originating tissue, this protein exp is expressed the most. Um, this is all stored in an RDF-like data model, which allows us also to easily combine proteomics and transcriptomics expression data. We will come to this also in, in a later slide. <coughs> So here, what we see is essentially expression data from various different cell lines. And obviously, all of these cell lines weren't acquired sort of by one single lab. So what we do here in ProtomCB, we look out for interesting publications in, 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 in a variety of journals. And if the data is made available, we actually go to Pride, reprocess this through a homogeneous pipeline and make the data here available in ProtomSDP. So we benefit a lot by, by the efforts of Pride and, and Protein Exchange to make such data available and also benefit a lot from, from annotating or from the authors annotating which raw files belongs to which sample here to be able to map which protein belongs to which cell in the end. What one can also do in ProtomisDB then is not only to look at the expression of a single protein, but also multiple proteins. Since we combine all of this in one common database scheme, we can then also easily ask questions like whether there is a particular expression pattern of multiple proteins visible when investigated across a larger number of cell lines or tissues. So what you see here is a classic expression heat map of a group of proteins, um, PSMB. So these are all proteins which make up the um, proteasome. And what one can nicely see here is that there appears to be a different varieties of the proteasome expressed across um, the different tissues and cell lines here plotted across the x-axis. And one can see that there's a, a proteasome, which is commonly known as the constitutive proteasome, which is sort of present in the um, non-immune um, um, associated um, tissues and cell lines, and then particularly in cell lines which are known to have a, a correlation with the immune system, we see that a certain um, group of proteins, is or three particular proteins, is exchanged against the, the induced version of that. So indicating that these cell lines um, then are likely very active in generating um, GA peptides. As mentioned, we um, use this ProtomSDB to also do um, a lot of data dissemination for, for the bigger projects um, which have been done in the group of Professor Brister. Um, so we store information about um, kinobeads assays. So here we measure um, the binding of drugs to kinases. And we store in the range of 10 to the 6 of those in, in ProtomisDB, where again one can dig down to every single dose um, response measurement and see exactly at which um, concentration of a drug one sees um, half maximal binding of that protein. We also support the visualization and storage of, of 
Zetsa data, so not only base meltone data, so at which temperature a protein is um, likely going to melt, but also uh, the visualization of um, its um, base melting behavior versus um, the melting behavior when a drug is present in the same system. So, and then typically the difference between two curves is an indication of whether there's binding happening between this um, drug and this protein, which may also give a slight indication about the potency of this. And um, we also store these um, protein turnover data. You can also dig down into every single measurement of this, um, investigating whether a protein may be an interesting target for a drug which um, was designed to specifically degrade that protein. So um, specifically for this drug, you may be interested in proteins which have a high turnover, so which show um, a um, rather um, short um, degradation time, and because then the chances of um, an active protein are, are rather high. All of this data can um, also be investigated sort of from a different angle. So earlier now we looked at a perspective from a protein. We can also look at the data from a perspective of a drug, right? So here, when the violin plots indicate the binding profile of um, the targets for two different drugs. Here, we're looking at imatinib and barfetinib. On the y-axis, we see the um, minus log 10 EC50 plotted, which indicates um, for a particular protein of interest whether this is um, likely to be a useful drug to inhibit this protein or not. So the number here indicates how many proteins show a more protein binding and more less protein binding. And then um, as we always tried in ProteMSDB for data dissemination and providing access to, to um, the, the level of granularity you're most, you're most interested in, one can dig down from these high level representations um, to uh, the binding curve and the respective um, binding measurements here with the black dots um, of every single binding curve of those. We um, have also made use of the availability of um, large phenotypic screens. So um, we've integrated data in ProteMSDB from big um, cell sensitivity screens done by, by uh, available by the CCLE um, or done by the, um, by the um, Sanger Institute and have made all of this data also available in ProteomSDB. So this was again similar to the data we um, reused from Pride that was all um, processed using a, a, the same processing pipeline to make sure that um, model fitting and so on is done exactly the same. And then in ProteMSDB, you can essentially select a um, cell sensitivity screen of interest and then investigate um, either for a particular cell line of interest or for a particular drug of interest, whether there is um, a particular cell line or drug um, respectively standing out with respect to sensitivity or resistance. So if you're interested, for example, in a cell line which shows um, no response when given a certain drug of interest you're studying in your, in your PhD um, um, thesis, for example, and you're interested in resistance mechanisms, um, this view, these parallel coordinates here, um, that would show a um, concentration dependent behavior and thus might be good candidates for figuring out potential resistance mechanisms of that drug. Or vice versa, you can also use this to figure out um, cell lines which are um, very, very sensitive to this drug. Um, if you then, for example, would like to um, turn this cell line into a resistant one by um, continuously growing the cell with um, low dosages of this drug. Um, similar to earlier, um, we start with very high level selection. So we may just select the GDSC data set here. Um, we may select um, imatinib as a drug of interest. Um, every single line here will then depict one single cell line of interest. One can then select the cell lines which show a um, high relative effect and a good model fit here indicated by the R group R2 and relative effect. And then investigate um, every single model fit um, manually and investigate how confident this model fit is by also looking at every single measurement of those. 
Um, something which we believe is rather unique here is that um, this visualization, as far as we are aware, is one of the only ones in the web these days still um, which allows you access to these large um, cell viability screens. So as far as I'm aware, um, there's, uh, um, I don't know any other tool which allows you to dig deep and, and specifically filter for cell lines or drugs of interest for these um, genomics data sets. The main goal of ProteomistDB then is also to integrate these different streams of information into sort of higher level features. Um, and I've depicted here a couple of those, right? So if we integrate, for example, um, the proteomics and the transcriptomics data, we can make use of this to um, come up with an alternative missing value imputation strategy. And this is also what we've done. So earlier, what we, what we and others have shown is that there seem to be a larger number of proteins which show a fairly good correlation, um, or a specific correlation between mRNA and protein. So what this allows us to do now is to make use of the transcriptomics data and impute missing proteomics expression data based on the mRNA profile. So here we've done this for a variety of different imputation methods. We've done this for um, just random sampling. So that would be um, just picking a, a random protein expression from the distribution of the rest of your proteins. Um, minimum of the samples distribution just picks the minimum um, protein expression observed for a particular sample and using this as an imputed, imputed value. Or we use the mRNA guided version. And if we um, actually do this, what we see is that the mRNA guided missing value imputation actually performs the best and results in the lowest mean absolute error when done, uh, when done on a set of proteins for which we know the expression in a cell line. What we can also integrate as um, protein expression profiles and cell viability data. Um, so we can um, actually use this and fit elastic net regression models one per drug and um, omics type, which allows us to investigate in more detail what potential biomarkers there are for um, predicting whether a cell line is likely going to be sensitive or resistant for a given drug. So what this elastic net regression model does in the background, it does um, feature selection. So it tries to figure out a small, a meaningful subset of proteins, which seem to be predictive for um, example, the AUC of a um, cell viability screen. And so the um, can plot to the no plot and then see that for um, cetuximab, um, FA2 appears to be a um, likely marker for resistance um, when using cetuximab. Um, ultimately, what we are planning on doing here is, and we are in the, on the verge of uh, expanding this much more, is to allow users to also upload their own data to this, and then apply the learned models to um, the data uh, the, to the data uploaded by the user, um, to have a feature which may predict which drug is likely going to be um, very effective for this cell line, or which drug may not be very effective for this cell line. This can potentially be expanded and may open up also avenues for, for personalized medicine in the future. One can also combine the protein expression profiles and cell viability data in a, in a different way. So earlier we were using these elastic net models. What one can also do is build alternative um, ontologies for cell lines. So what we heavily make use of in ProteomistDB is ontology is allowing us to connect, for example, cell lines to organs. However, just because a cell line may originate from, from a liver does not necessarily mean it also behaves like a liver cell. So what we can do is we can actually build these um, ontologies of how cell lines and tissues are um, connected to each other based on their molecular profile. So we can use the expression data and the, the way how cell lines behave when um, um, drugs are used um, to build um, molecular fingerprint um, driven ontologies for um, cell lines. And what we see here then, or what we can then also use this for is to um, suggest potential treatments for new cell lines, because they may be in a sub branch of this tree, which may all be rather um, sensitive to a particular drug of interest. 
So today, um, ProteomCB really expanded from just human and proteomics to a large range of um, different omics types um, with um, different capabilities of integrating these different omics types. And that was really largely the result of, of um, previous efforts to make all of this available. Right. So a, a single lab would have never been able to really do all of these studies themselves and build a resource which covers that many organisms and, and that many omics types um, by themselves. So this with, without access to, to data, this would have really not been possible. Over the last um, a year roughly, we've also spent a lot of time and effort on re-implementing ProteomistDB and, and, and modernizing its user interface. So given its 10 years of, of continuous development, um, the initial uh, user interface we provide appears a bit outdated these days. So what we have essentially done is re-implement all of this into a more modern uh, um, framework. We are using Vue.js for this, which also really allows us to more rapidly prototype new um, applications. Um, so this is what ProteomistDB um, looks like if you go to ProteomistDB.org slash woo um, these days. So we have a much more, we believe, clean and, um, and modern um, feeling user interface, which also allowed us to integrate software developed, for example, by Uniprot. So what you see here is um, formerly known as the Prot Vista viewer um, these days. I think it's available via the name Nightingale which essentially shows the protein information um, on, on a, um, as, as a, um, here depicted as the x-axis, as the protein sequence, and then superimposed or, or below this on, on certain tracks, you find annotations, for example, which part of the sequence um, we have evidence based on peptide level or which, of the, uh, which part of the sequence are annotated to known domains. Um, and on top of this, there's also a really nice integration of a 3D visualization of the protein, which is connected to the um, feature viewer on the top, which allows us to investigate in particular, for example, where a domain is located in the 3D structure or where a particular modification or maybe also mutation is located in the structure to figure out whether, for example, a phosphorylation may have actually an effect on, on the activity um, of a protein. The newer version also allows um, the integration of AlphaFold 2 predictions. So essentially, this viewer works for pretty much any human protein of interest and essentially for all proteins covered um, by the recently developed resource. Um, so we've tested this recently on a rice protein. So even there, this feature viewer actually allows you to um, investigate the protein structure of rice proteins in 3D model. In this process, we have also completely revamped the um, spectrum viewer, um, which now actually pulls predictions of prosit um, in real time. So you can, for any peptide of uh, any peptide um, present in ProteomSDB, um, that will fetch a prediction by prosit and then show this then um, straight. Because of these efforts, um, we um, also reworked our um, uh, the verification, or we are starting to verify ProteomistDB. So um, we've um, made the re-implementation of ProteomistDB available. So the, the source code of the Wu interface you will find in, under this link. Um, we also um, redeveloped or revamped our API, um, which now essentially provides access to all the data stored in ProteomistDB, so including the transcriptomics data, including the phenomics data, that was not possible earlier. And as mentioned, we, we heavily benefit from the availability of, of, of your research, um, um, which allows us to really integrate this um, in, in ProteomistDB with other, other um, sources of information. Um, one other aspect um, where um, we also benefit from, from Pride is um, a project called Protein Tools, where we synthesized a large number of um, synthetic peptides, essentially with the goal to represent the human proteome by this. And um, all of this data is also available in Pride. And as far as the 2020 statistics are, actually also turned out to be the most downloaded projects in Pride. Um, 
And some of the other data sets we have made available in ProteinsDB also appear really high in this list. So we, are, we are very happy to see this, and very happy to see that um, the data here is, is um, reused. Again, without efforts such as Pride, and Juan will certainly go into more detail in the following talk, this would have certainly not been possible. Um, we also benefit from the availability of your data in doubt um, for the development of um, our deep learning framework Prosit. So in the past, we have spent a considerable amount of effort in um, developing a prediction tool, which um, allows to predict at which retention time a peptide is likely going to be observable in a measurement and what the fragmentation spectrum of this, of this um, peptide will look like. We've done this in the past for um, not labeled peptide. Here, I want to briefly highlight um, Prosit and, and the benefits from public data on TMT labeled peptides. So we have recently extended the Proteome Tools resource by um, the TMT labeled equivalents of the synthetic peptides we have made available earlier. We've retrained our Prosit model for these TMT labeled peptides. Um, here, slight uh, side note is that this is a model which supports both HCD and CID fragmentation in one model, um, and can as, as, um, and see that the prediction um, accuracy is, is uh, quite high. Um, what we were interested in is whether this model, um, which was not trained exclusively for TMT labeled peptides, is also applicable to iTrack labeled peptides or TMT pro labeled peptides. And given that the Proteome Tools project is actually, in fact, um, um, already over, so we don't have any funding for this anymore, we benefited here from going into Pride and looking for interesting data sets which have um, used iTrack or TMT Pro labeling. We pulled out this data um, and compared the predictions made by Prosit TMT to this. And somewhat surprisingly, we see that Prosit TMT actually works quite well for iTrack labeled peptides and also TMT Pro labeled peptides. So here on the left hand side, so you see two mirror plots examples for iTrack 8 plex and TMT 18 plex. And yes, the intensities don't match perfectly, which is somewhat expected given that we have trained this on TMT classic, so the TMT 6, 10, 11 plex labeling. Um, but it actually still shows the Pearson correlation of 0.9. So this is actually still quite nice. And also the retention time prediction works surprisingly well when using Prosit TMT. Um, we have then also asked the question, well, if we can predict these peptides decently well, um, can we also improve this rescoring mechanism, which was um, 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 introduced earlier? And what we see also here is that this Prosit TMT model actually works um, surprisingly well on iTrack and TMT Pro label data. So here you see um, bar plots indicating in blue the overlap between an analysis where um, no rescoring was done or where this rescoring mecha mechanism was used. In green, you see the peptides which are um, added by this rescoring. Um, and we see here on PSM and peptide level for this eye track data set an increase in the range of um, 40 to 50 percent, which also actually has a drastic effect on the number of protein groups identified. And here we are looking actually at body fluid, so um, don't, don't expect super high numbers here. And the same we also see for TMT 18 plex. So um, without access to the data, validating such hypothesis would have not been possible. So we are super grateful for, for all the efforts and also by the authors of the original studies to make all of the, all of the data available. Um, ultimately, there is, I guess, still um, a bit of work to do. Um, I guess ultimately what we are interested in is um, predicting all relevant peptide properties. So we these days have good predictors for fragmentation. We have good predictors for retention time. But we may not really have good predictors yet for which peptides are going to be visible. And we see the first predictors appearing, which um, attempt to predict the uh, relative intensities of peptides. Um, but here also, we benefit a lot from having data publicly available, because most of these properties can only be learned, particularly when using deep learning, with access to a large amount of that. There are still a couple of challenges involved here, and particularly from my perspective, um, um, for DMSDB and Prosit, I see two big challenges. Um, generally, in proteomics, I think we still suffer from a huge number of different protocols used. 
Yeah, so the way how proteins are extracted, the way data acquisition is done, the way data analysis is done is pretty much different for any two data sets you look at in Pride, um, which really has a sense of um, um, limits um, the ability to integrate different, um, different data sets in one resource. So it feels like uh, as a community, we should at some point really start a more concerted effort to um, bringing down the number of protocols um, used in the, in the wet lab um, to really benefit from having all of this data available. With this comes also um, still this problem that most of the research published these days um, is often not very extensively annotated. So what we often run into when trying to integrate data into ProteomistDB is that we find a useful publication, we think this is a cool data set to integrate in ProteomistDB, and then we can't really do that because there's no information provided which raw file belongs to which sample, which sample belongs to which experiment, and what were the exact conditions under which um, the specimen was generated. So what exact drug was used, which dosage of the drug was done, um, which um, treatment time was used. And that seems to be, um, I, I foresee that this is um, likely only be possible if we start enforcing such metadata um, upon um, submission of such data sets. Again, the, especially the, the TriLab component, so learning properties of those and integrating data from this would really benefit from, from a common standard here. Um, with this, I do believe I'm somewhat within the time limit. Um, I, I'm for most of what I've showed here, I, I'm, I'm only the messenger. So there's plenty of people walking behind this on this. Um, so I, I'm in the luxury position, position of really only showing the results of this. Um, here you see a picture of my new group. So I've recently started my own group at the TU Munich. I'm super grateful for this. I'm super happy to work all with all these um, exceptional um, people. I'm also grateful for, for funding. With that, I thank you. And I guess there will be time for questions later. Okay, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, we'll, we'll keep the questions until the end of the session, and we will ask questions of both you and Juanan. Uh, there's already one in the chat, but we'll keep that for, for later. And so without much further ado, I, uh, I think it's time to listen to Juanan. We've heard you mention Pride several times, Matthias. Uh, obviously, Pride is one of the cornerstones of data transmission uh, and sharing, if you like, in proteomics. And uh, it is interesting to see what Juan Antonio has to tell us about Pride data reuse, uh, including and on top of what we have seen already. So Juan, of course, entirely yours. You should unmute Juan, that will help. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, thank you, Leonard, and also especially thank you for uh, thank you, Matthias, for uh, being really a good introduction for many of the topics that I want to uh, uh, talk about in in my talk. So um, this is the um, overview of what we I want to cover in my talk. I will give a short introduction to Pride on Protein Exchange. Then I will make a kind of uh, educational uh, route about uh, the types of data reuse that exist. I think it's interesting for those of you that are maybe not that experts in the field. Then I will talk about uh, one problem that just has been mentioned by Matthias, improving metadata notation in public data sets. And then I will uh, highlight, but just very briefly, some efforts that we are doing locally to disseminate and to reuse uh, public proteomics data. Okay, so, uh, Again, Matthias was a good introduction. Uh, Pride is the uh, uh, largest database worldwide for storing uh, mass spectrometry based proteomics data sets. Uh, Pride stores all types of uh, uh, data, including the raw data, the uh, identification, quantification results. All proteomics approaches are supported. And at the moment, it contains approximately 26 and a half, uh, uh, and a half thousand data sets. So, uh, because Pride is so widely used, is recognized uh, uh, in Europe as an Elixir core data resource. But we are not working in isolation. I wanted to mention that uh, in the field, we are actually quite lucky because it doesn't happen in other fields. We are quite collaborative. And together with our colleagues in the US and in Japan and China, we uh, set up the Protein Exchange Consortium, trying to implement a standard, a standard data submission and data dissemination practices between the main protein repositories. 
So this was started now around 10 years ago and uh, data sharing uh, has to be generalized in, in the field. This is because of two reasons, because of, of course the push of journals and funding agencies for, uh, for open science practices, but also because the field has really uh, perceived that uh, these resources are uh, stable and, and, and can really uh, deal with this, this amount of data. So um, Pride is uh, the resource in Europe and uh, this is just to show you, I always uh, show uh, this kind of charts in, uh, in my presentations, just to say that uh, this is where Protein Exchange started like 10 years ago. And 10 years later, really the, the amount of data sets that are submitted per month has grown enormously. So I think we are kind of stabilized in the, in the last year or so, or we are stabilizing more or less. Uh, but you can see that uh, this is the number of uh, uh, submitted data sets per year, and um, at least till 2021, we're still growing. Uh, 5,800 data sets were submitted just uh, during, uh, during last year, almost 500. And of course, Pride is the world leading resource, storing more than 83% of all protein exchange data sets. So I'm not going to talk about the details about uh, how we do this because, uh, but uh, believe me, it's a very tough job to have the infrastructure to be able to, to, to deal with, with this amount of data and also to support uh, 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 researchers in the field. Uh, so the second part of uh, my presentation, I wanted to uh, really do, an, as I said, uh, educational kind of uh, lecture about uh, the types of data reuse that are there. And this is really the main point that I want to highlight. And it was nice to hear uh, previous presentations, also the last one from Matthias, that really one of the reasons why we are doing this, one of the reasons why Pride and Protein Exchange exist is to really, is to really enable uh, data reuse. And it is very nice to see that in the last few years, the, um, data reuse has really increased a lot in the field for, for many of these applications that I will mention uh, next. So a few years ago, and this is when I start the, the kind of the educational part of my, of my talk. Um, Harald and Leonard and others, we wrote a review about the uh, data reuse in proteomics. This review was uh, written like six years ago now. There are some things that uh, you know, have both a little bit, but still some of the concepts there are, are, can, can perfectly be applied today. So we came at the time with four ways to, uh, or four categories to use the data, use, reuse, reprocess, and repurpose. And I'm going to explain the last three of them, uh, starting by reuse, just to highlight the possibilities of having that data in the public domain. So the first type of uh, use that I want to highlight is what we call reuse. And the way we, uh, we defined this was that the information or the data is, is not only extracted and copied, but reused in new experiments with the potential of generating new knowledge. And I want to highlight that uh, these uh, um, two categories of uh, data reuse in this context, the building of spectral libraries and the benchmarking of tools and software. I mean, many of you are familiar with the spectral libraries. There are a lot that are created and uh, by, for instance, different proteomics repositories by NIST, they're really, uh, kind of uh, considered to be the, the gold standard by many in the field. But uh, this is only possible because uh, there are a lot of data sets in the public domain that enable the construction of these uh, spectral libraries. And of course, the popularity of a spectral libraries has increased in, in, in recent years because uh, they can be used to analyze data depending data independent acquisition experiments. And then, of course, there is the use of benchmarking software and tools. This is what uh, we also have to do all bioinformaticians where we build a new tool. We need to compare it to all the tools that existed in the past. And for doing this, um, there are, of course, uh, the need to, uh, to apply to, to data sets. So that's why many data sets are reused to benchmark new algorithms and on software. So again, comparison with previous tools is essential when developing or, or assessing new tools. So usually the raw data is used as the base. So a new uh, analysis performed but it's not always the case. And this is really, there are a lot of examples. And uh, there are basically, I don't know, dozens, even hundreds of publications where, uh, where public data sets that are used for uh, benchmarking purposes. And these are just a few examples. 
So um, the third category of, of, uh, of data reuse in, in proteomics is what we call a reprocess. In this case, what happens is that the, the data are reprocessed or reanalyzed with the intention of obtaining new knowledge or to provide an updated view of the results. It mainly serves the same purpose of the original experiment. Uh, and one example is a, a subgrant data set can be reprocessed with a different algorithm or search engine or using an updated sequence database because of course, uh, protein sequence databases, they, they change in time. And one particular type of these experiments is what uh, they are called meta-analysis approaches, where uh, data coming from a lot of experiments together, sorry, data uh, coming from a lot of experiments are put together to extract new knowledge. Um, of course, some examples, for instance, data integration of studies with, uh, with different purposes. So there are two different approaches, the data use, using the data submitted, or as available in the supplementary material of manuscripts, but also a reanalysis uh, of all the data together. And this, again, there are some examples of papers that have been published in, uh, in, in, in recent years that just do that. They go to, to, to Pride, they download data sets that are somehow related, and uh, all the data sets are reanalyzed uh, in a consistent manner. And at the end, the extracted common knowledge is uh, of course higher than uh, the analysis of each original uh, data set individual. And uh, one particular type of data reuse that is nice is what, uh, uh, what, is, what is called repurposing. So in this, uh, we can have this category, meaning that the data are considered in light of a question or a context that is different from the originally uh, published study. So uh, there are different categories of this, but we could uh, highlight proteinomics studies, for instance, or discovery of novel, novel post-traditional modifications, for instance, uh, using like uh, open modification uh, searches tools. So in the, in the context of proteinomics, I'm including this slide to introduce what proteinomics is. Uh, for those of you that don't know about it, proteomics data is in this kind of approaches is combined with genomics and, trans or, and or transcriptomics information, typically by using sequence databases generated from DNA sequencing effort, RNA sec experiments, ribose approaches, or for instance, London coding RNAs. So the, the search database is, is built using this kind of data coming from mainly sequencing efforts. Um, there are many applications for, for this type of, of studies, uh, but uh, one of them that has been really popular uh, using public data sets is uh, improvement in genome annotation efforts. So of course, uh, genome annotation is also something that is very dynamic and that changes and uh, new types of experimental evidences are, um, are looked all the time in order to improve in uh, the gene models in many cases. And uh, instead of generating new data in order to be able to do that, you can again come to Pride, uh, download the data sets that you consider to be the most in interesting ones and reanalyze them in a, in, a, in a consistent manner using this kind of uh, databases generated in the way that I explained before. So this has been done for uh, human data sets and there are some even resources that have been a kind of uh, set up uh, doing this like uh, uh, small open reading frames or the uh, London coding uh, encyclopedia. And, and there are also individual papers or research papers that have been, have been uh, based on, on this kind of data reuse approaches. It has been known uh, for human, and this has been really uh, historically quite relevant, but in the last years, this has been extended to, uh, of course, model organisms like mouse, rat, Drosophila, and actually other microorganisms as well, like uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis or helicobacter pylori, rice, etc. Again, uh, these are some publications that uh, have been published uh, in, 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 in recent years, again, by many different research groups when uh, where this has been uh, done. And uh, in the last few years, <laughs> it has kind of a, a, a kind of new category. We didn't include this in, in this original paper when we wrote it. Like um, that, uh, it, I mean, the, it, it can be done <laughs> in uh, uh, combining this, uh, these three categories that, are, that I mentioned before. Either we use, uh, where again, the data is put in a different context, we process when the data is reanalyzed or repurposed, when the data is reanalyzed for a different purpose. And this again was mentioned by Matthias in the previous uh, in the previous talk, and are of course the wide variety of uh, 
applications of machine learning, deep learning approaches in proteomics. And in this case, like again, it was highlighted before by, uh, by Matthias, but also by Artur, uh, public data sets are of, often reused as, uh, as training sets. And of course, this can be used to improve um, different aspects of the proteomics uh, workflow, like uh, digestion or liquid chromatography or mobility or pe prediction of peptide fermentation, as it was mentioned before by, uh, by, by Matthias, or peptide protein identification, et cetera. But what is also more interesting is that there are other type of um, uh, data integration studies where uh, this kind of approaches are used to predict uh, kind of biological properties. And there are more and more and more uh, papers that, uh, uh, that are published and many of them are actually quite interesting. And I think this is quite important for, for proteomics as a whole, not only, not only being focused on, you know, in the proteomics uh, data analysis workflow, which of course is very nice and is needed, but also to focus in, in using proteomics data to, to, to make also biological conclusions. So um, just uh, to uh, uh, kind of uh, summarize uh, this part, or not summarize, but at least to come with some conclusions at the end, uh, there's a lot of public uh, data reuse that has been already done, but of course there are uh, some bottlenecks that uh, I would like to highlight here. The first one is that uh, proteomics data can be quite complex and they constitute a steep learning curve in some cases for researchers working in other fields. For instance, here in the campus where I work, you know, there are many people working uh, in, in transcriptomics and they all, or, or, always complain, oh, it's proteomics is so difficult. And it's true, there's a, in some cases a steep learning curve for, uh, for researchers working in other fields. Then mass spectrometry raw data is big in terms of the, the big sizes of the files. And this is kind of uh, a limitation in many cases, but this has been solved by um, the, availability, the availability of uh, cloud uh, infrastructure for uh, uh, data uh, analysis and data analysis in general. Then, of course, software and analysis methods are in some cases very dynamic. That means that um, one tool could change very rapidly. And of course, there is some work in adapting uh, 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 new tools or different versions of tools to uh, data analysis. Then. There is the problem that uh, of uh, MS vendors that uh, Windows is often a requirement for analysis software, and it doesn't really fit very well with this other statement that I mentioned before. That in some cases, uh, because the data is very big, there is the need to have uh, like cloud-based infrastructure in order to be able to analyze or reanalyze this data, and um, and the dependency on Windows is a problem for this. But uh, luckily. This is changing, and there are some tools in, in, in recent years that have made uh, much more uh, easy uh, that, uh, that, I mean, that because we don't have to rely on Windows as, as much as we had to in, in the past. And then the last kind of bottleneck that I wanted to highlight uh, is the lack of enough metadata annotations in public data sets. And again, this has been mentioned before by Matthias, and is the focus of the, of the next section of my talk. So, uh, which is devoted to improving metadata annotation of public data sets. So I think that it's important to, uh, to, um, to give a little bit of historical perspective to say that uh, really till, till very recently, uh, just a few years ago, uh, uh, it was very difficult. To, there were really not so many uh, data sets in the public domain. It was only when protein exchange was started and there was this push by journals and, and funding agencies and also, I mean, by the community as a whole, that really uh, data sharing uh, got uh, popular in the field. So at the time when we started Proton Exchange, our main objective at the time was really, oh, we need to make data sharing popular. So at the time also, because proteomics is really a, a analytical discipline, and uh, the focus was not that much put on the uh, metadata at the level of the sample. What we wanted to achieve at the time, again, is that data sharing uh, became popular. And then, Kind of our idea was yes. Once we do, uh, once we do this, then we can raise the bar in terms of in terms of metadata. So at the moment, what is needed for performing a submission to Pride or any program exchange resource is a, a data set general description that includes information about uh, you know the submitter, the organism, the tissues that are involved there, 
and uh, and personal lesson modifications, data processing, and, and similar things. But they are all at the level of the data set. And then we have all the data files, like the raw NS instrument files, the, res the results, or other type of files. But what is really missing there is the link between you know, the files and the samples. This always been, uh, as I said, missing because of the reason that I mentioned before. It was not our decision. It was also the decision of the, the community, as I always say, because we had a, a number of meetings to, to discuss this. And um, as Matthias again highlighted before, this is essential work required for improving reuse of, uh, of prior data sets. So um, um, we have developed, uh, it, this was done in the last uh, few years. And again, it was not done only by us, but by all, many other people in the community, uh, something that at least was lacking as a first step. The first step was to have a format that was uh, common, that was a standard, and that anyone could use to do that because uh, there, was, uh, there, there was no such uh, file format before. So because we didn't want to basically reinvent the wheel, we uh, reuse what our colleagues in the ABI here, the team, uh, the functional dynamics team that are in charge of Array Express, but also Special Atlas, what they did in, in the past. So uh, they come out at the time with uh, one format that was called uh, MageTab. And the format had two parts. One, what is called the investigation description format or IDF that describes the experiment of the data set. We already have this information, including each submitted uh, data set to Pride, because again, this information was already requested from the beginning. So we actually don't need this file because this file can be generated internally once uh, the, uh, the data sets are submitted. And then we have the second part of the format, a delimited file that is called SDRF, Sample and Data Relationship Format, that describes the individual samples and how they relate to the data files. So again, because we didn't want to uh, reinvent the wheel, a new flavor of SDRF was developed. It's called SDRF uh, proteomics. It's a tab delimited file and is especially tailored for proteomics experimental approaches. I actually didn't have to do personally that much with it. I contributed a little bit, but uh, really not much. This was what was led by Jacet Perret Rivero, uh, but also by many people in the community, especially from, from EUBIC, since this uh, event is also a UPA uh, event. I, I want to highlight this. And also by some people in the PSI, the Proteomics Standards Initiative. And there's been this GitHub site that has uh, been used to uh, annotate data sets that are that were available in the public domain already. And uh, I think this has been uh, a, a success. Uh, some um, um, some uh, changes we did in Pride is to support the uh, SDRF proteomics files, the submission using the Pride submission tool, but also we generate uh, biosample IDs for each individual sample, including from the SDRF file. And we can show this now in the in the pride web in the pride web interface so the status of things at the moment this was published last year again many of the other people in this uh, in, in in this uh, uh, workshop are authors here the sort of things is that uh, we develop uh, what uh, we call a match tab proteomics because again it's based on the original uh, match tab for transcriptomics it's composed of two parts, SDRF uh, proteomics, which contains the mappings of the samples with the files, and IDF, that is the general information at the level of the, of the, data, of the data set. Uh, the SDRF proteomics can now be include, included in data sets submitted to Pride. It's optional at present. But actually, I have to say that uh, people are already generating quite uh, some of these data sets, uh, 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 annotated files themselves. So there are at the moment more than 400 annotated data sets in Pride already. Uh, half of them come from the site, from the GitHub site that I mentioned before, but the other half are, have already been annotated by users that were interested in providing this information to facilitate data reuse. The files at the moment can be created using Excel or analogous, or analogous software. Of course, this is what uh, uh, we don't want to stop there. Uh, the idea is to make much easier the creation of these files, again, to uh, enable easier, easier data reuse of public data sets. So we really want to promote exports to the format coming from, from popular tools in the field. This is one way to, uh, to improve adoption. The other way that we already tried, but it's quite challenging, we didn't succeed. 
so far is to develop a web annotator tool that can be used by anyone in the community. We had an initial version, but we, we didn't think it was good enough because as soon as the uh, data set contains many files, it's actually, it's actually quite, quite challenging to, to, to make it work in, in, in the way that we, we like things to work. So, so we will keep trying, I think, maybe at some point we'll be able to uh, provide this to the community, but at the moment, uh, at the moment uh, this is a still work in progress. And again, once these uh, kind of tools are more um, widely available, our idea would be to, to make the submissions, including, including this information mandatory, but they cannot be mandatory right now because you know we are receiving 500 data sets per month we cannot, our thing is relatively small. We, we cannot really um, help every single user to create the files in, in, in the right manner. But we have, of course, this as, as one of the you know, final goals that we would like to achieve. Okay, and the last part of my talk in the last few minutes that I have, I wanted to mention some efforts in house that we are doing in, 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 in the sense of uh, data reuse of data sets and dissemination of proteomics data to uh, what we call added value resources. So again, uh, Matthias uh, introduced many of the, the concepts now. I just want to uh, highlight what is the general idea. The general idea again is that uh, individual submitters or large scale projects, they submit the data to protein exchange resources. Of course, Pride is in, in the center because again, this is by far the most popular resource. And then this data is reused and make available in uh, bioinformatic resources that Actually, they are not only accessed by proteomics people in a way that they are all also accessed by, uh, by uh, other people that maybe they are not so experts in proteomics because we really need to uh, to make proteomics data available in, in a wider context. And the, these are resources like uh, Uniprot, Ensemble, um, Expression Atlas, uh, Nextprot, uh, the LNCpedia, CSMHC Atlas for immune peptidomics, and of course, and very importantly, uh, proteomics DB, as, as uh, Matthias saw before. In the context of, of Pride, what we are trying to do, rather than you know, set up new resources for proteomics data, which is really more difficult to sustain in the, in the medium long term. What we are uh, uh, going, or what we are trying to do, is take advantage of our location at the at the ABI and to work with uh, some colleagues in the institute, so that we can integrate proteomics data with other types of uh, data, omics data in popular bioinformatics resources. So again, proteomics data is made more accessible to biologists. So we are doing at the moment this with four different resources: protein sequences and PTNs with Uniprot, uh, protein expression information with Expression Atlas. I will, I will mention briefly some of the efforts that we are doing in this context. And then we are doing uh, also analogous projects with Ensemble Genome Browser for proteinomics information um, with Magnify, which is a resource that stores uh, mainly uh, metagenomics experiments. And we are trying to integrate metaproteomics and meta, uh, metagenomics experiments there. Uh, the projects, uh, all the projects are quite different. Uh, it's challenging to do all at the same time. We are again a, a small team. And uh, so there are uh, kind of different stages of, of development right now. I'm going to mention this is uh, in, in a way um, um, complementary to what uh, Matthias has explained before for uh, proteomics DB. Um, one of the resources we have uh, worked more closely is Expression Atlas, which is the ABR resource that so far it only uh, stored uh, gene expression information. But uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we have been able to integrate there also uh, quite a, a um, number of uh, protein uh, expression information as well coming from generalists of data sets. So now quantitative proteomics data sets are systematically integrated in expression atlas. Again, I'm not, I don't have too much time to talk about it in detail, but uh, we are doing this for data dependent acquisition data sets. We have done this uh, using baseline data coming from cell lines and tumor tissue data human baseline tissues and mouse and rat baseline tissues. Uh, and of course we did this because it kind of was kind of the, the easier way to, to start uh, to start with. We have also uh, done some integration of baseline data sets of coming from data independent acquisition approaches. And we have done also some pilots on differential analysis, but we are not still not confident of uh, kind of um, promoting this too much because it's more complicated and there is, uh, we, I think we have to work a little bit more on inter more differential, differential data sets. 
the workflow is always the same. And again, this was highlighted again by Matthias. Um, we take uh, data sets that are available in the public domain, mainly from Pride. They need to be curated because again, in, in many cases, they don't have enough metadata annotation for the reason that I mentioned before. And then once they're uh, manually curated, they are put in the right format. Then the data sets are reanalyzed. In this particular case, we are using MaxQuant for DDA data sets. Then there is some uh, post-processing that takes place to generate normalized uh, protein abundances. And then the data uh, after some quality assessment and again, some extra post-processing is made available uh, through uh, EBI special atlas. So uh, we have, well, I mean, we have done more, but the, the ones that are maybe uh, I can highlight here because they are more recent are, uh, we have done uh, 24 human data sets containing 60, 67 tissues and 31 organs. And then we have also done 14 mouse data sets and nine rat data sets containing 14 organs or, and 34 tissues. So organs is just a way to, uh, to group different tissues together to try to have the aggregation done uh, at a different level than the tissues. So I don't have too much time to talk about in detail about this, but once we have all the results, it's possible to, to make comparisons like what we can show in this chart. Well, it is possible to do uh, the a global expression correlation analysis between the three species, between human and mouse, between human and rat, and between mouse and rat, of course, for the tissues that are common, so liver, lung, uh, and testes. And then it is possible to, uh, to come up with visualization of, <coughs> of orthologous genes in the three species and how they are uh, represented. So is it possible to do this kind of comparison among orthologs in the three species? So if you want to know more about this, I know this is very brief, uh, but there's a paper we already published in scientific data about uh, protein expression in cell lines and tumor tissues. There is one that is almost now uh, accepted for publication for baseline mouse and rat expression. And there is the other one for baseline human tissues that uh, is still uh, under review. And again, I would like to highlight that we have also done this for uh, data independent acquisition data sets. In this case, uh, it's again the same pipeline curation, putting the uh, putting the data in the, in the right format. In this case, we have used uh, open swath and a common uh, spectral library. We use also by profit and trick, and then there is some kind of uh, again quality assessment and normalization. Uh, and at the end, the data goes into expression atlas. And I don't have time to talk too much about it again. I'm running out of time, but uh, the actual manuscript is available in BioArchive and it has been just accepted last week in scientific data as well. So this is kind of some of the visualization that can be seen in a special atlas when it is possible to see protein expression and, uh, and gene expression in the same uh, web interface. And uh, just to finalize, uh, also another thing that we are doing is uh, in collaboration with the Uniprot team is uh, really to try to address a problem that PTN data is really underrepresented in Uniprot for uh, for relations, of course, the first priority. And what we are trying to do also for fair, uh, looking for uh, to address the fair principles, is to improve the traceability between the PTNs annotated in Uniprot and the mass spec, uh, mass spec data stored in Pride. So uh, we have set up a systematic analysis pipelines for public PTN proteomics data sets in collaboration with our colleagues in uh, Peter Dallas, Eric Deutsch, and also my colleague Andy Jones in the University of Liverpool here. UK, a place that we call as the PTN exchange. The idea again is that the data that is going to appear in Uniprot is linked to the experimental data in Pride or, or Perfect Atlas, if that's the case. So, so far, what I can report for this is a benchmarking paper we have tried to, uh, to do for improving the reliability of phosphorylation data and analysis that is available in BioArchive. Then we have done two uh, first studies for uh, price uh, phosphorylation and plus minus phosphorylation. And also, we have developed a kind of initial version of data formats and analysis guidelines looking for community agreements. So because we see this as an ongoing thing in the, in the medium uh, long term. Okay, and just to finalize this, that, um, that uh, many of these ideas came from a previous work in collaboration with Pedro Beltraus group, uh, uh, also when he was at the ABI. But I'm running out of time, so just to summarize, Pride Archive and Protein Exchange, uh, there is really increasing amount of data available in the public domain. Uh, they really enable big data processing proteomics. 
There are uh, improvements in metadata that are required to enable a better reuse of data sets. Uh, I mentioned the improvements here in the development of uh, the proteomics file format. And then working in different activities related to data reuse, data examination, as explaining our efforts in the context of quantitative proteomics data sets with expression elements and for transnational notifications within the group. Uh, and these are just not our efforts, but efforts uh, by other people in the community. And what is nice to see is that really there are new resources that are being set up in the last two, three years that are basically based in reusing public proteomics data. You can visit some of these resources and, and give it a go because, uh, again, new resources that have, it's very nice to see that in the last two or three years they have been started. So just to really finalize, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, all the people that uh, work in the team, uh, especially the, the press that I present today, and to have the work done by Jesse Perry Riverall and Anth, uh, and also uh, Matthias Walser. And of course, our collaborators on EBI, uh, Protein Exchange, and also Peggy UK collaborators, and of course, all our funders. Of course, to all of you who make the data available in Pride and that enable uh, this kind of uh, studies. So yeah, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. I'm sorry, I think I, I went over time for three minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Juanan. Um, with that, we are uh, through the session. Uh, Matthias is there as well. So we have one question in the chat so far, uh, which is aimed at Matthias. Um, I guess you read it, Matthias, but I'll, I'll read it out loud also for the recording is, um, how do, are you doing the batch correction to compare across samples on slide 10? And maybe it might be useful to go back to slide 10 on your, uh, to share your screen and show slide 10 again so that we all know what this is about. I remember yeah. because I read it when it came in, but I'm sure other people may have forgotten slide 10. Yes, so let me just sort my screens and stuff and try and bring slide 10 to attention. So this was slide 10, I guess, right? Yep. So um, let's swap it around. So yeah, so as, as mentioned on one of my last slides, um, integrating data from different um, resources or projects as, as still quite a challenge, right? And I think the way how we do it in ProteomistDB is like likely not the gold standard. Um, if, if, so what we do is um, we essentially calculate IBEC values based on the uh, um, quantification data we have, and then essentially bring that to the same scale using um, a sort of similar normalization as done in transcriptomics, where we essentially divide by the sort of summed up intensity of all proteins identified, right? So that aims to making sure that the distribution of protein expressions you have are located roughly at the same place. So essentially what we do is we transform these IBEC values into IBEC values which are expressed by parts per million, right? So this protein is um, present in that sample um, 250 parts per million with respect to all the proteins expressed in that sample. That at least makes sure, makes sure, we have tested this, that seems to make sure that the, the plain numbers we get are, in, are independent of the depth at which the protein was analyzed. Right? So when you do very shallow fractionation, you may only identify 3,000 proteins. If you do heavy offline fractionation, you may identify 11,000 proteins. So this normalization seems to take care of this effect. What we can't really do at the time yet systematically is account for differences in, for example, digestion. Right? So if you use different digestion protocols where um, somebody is doing an overnight digest and, and some other and some other project there was the, was a one hour digest using some pressure cooker, we can't really account for that. And I think without the necessary metadata on this, I think it's also very difficult to come up with normalization strategies which could account for that. Uh, we, we simply don't have that annotation yet systematically for a large amount of projects um, available to us. Yeah, so the batch corrections which, which go with regards to uh, effects introduced by the wet lab, right? So the, the differences in, in doing digestion and differences in doing um, fractionation and so on, um, we currently can't account for. And this is why I would also if you look at proteomics DB and expression values, I wouldn't look for the small differences, right? So if there's large differences, they are likely real. If there are small differences, I would be careful with those. What we do in proteomics DB is if the data allows, so um, you see here on the, on the bar plot, 
some of them have an error bar. And that essentially shows you the min and max expression we have observed for that particular tissue in case we have multiple samples, projects, experiments covering this. So this may give you an indication of what range, um, given the different protocols used, you may expect. Yep. Okay. So if uh... Anybody? Maybe I can comment a little bit on that. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, so I, because I didn't have time to explain in detail. So I just I just I, I can just explain the approach that we follow. It's not by any means perfect because that, I don't think there's the perfect way to do this. But uh, on top of what Matthias mentioned that normalizing per the normal uh, the total number of intensity per round, what we do afterwards is that we basically create a, a distribution of intensities uh, across the, the proteins. And then create a different bins. <clears throat> we put the proteins in, in different bins, and then we assign you know one one value to each bin. We have tried different different uh, you know number of bins. At the end, uh, we came up with five as a kind of optimal number that uh, works well for us, and uh, it helps to make the data more comparable. In some cases, also reduces the number of batch effects. Uh, I'm not saying this is perfect. There has the limitation that, of course, the, the data, um, prep, you know, the data, process, um, the sample preparation can be different, especially between experiments where there is fractionation and those that where there is no fractionation. But uh, this approach at least uh, helps a little bit uh, on making the data kind of uh, more comparable, I would say. Uh, this is not um, a very sophisticated approach. It's just something that uh, we also tried, of course, other other methods like uh, Combat and Lima, and this kind of uh, R packages that are basically developed originally for transcriptomics data, but found actually that uh, the simple kind of uh, categorization in, in beans, uh, it, it worked better, at least for us, and in the data sets that we have done. So uh, so that's basically what uh, what I wanted to what I wanted to say. <clears throat> just just to add a small note on this, and I guess we are facing the same problem here, mm -hmm. right? So that in, in most cases, if you're looking at, at um, data from two different experiments, yeah. they will likely have no sample shared, right? Not even the same cell line used. Yeah. So how do you normalize two data sets mm -hmm. which don't have, in quotes, anything in common, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you can't, it's, it's very tough to define something like an M combat normalization scheme if you don't have something where you could argue that they should be the same. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's a very interesting problem that will, uh, that will have quite a few people bust their heads over the next years, but it's an interesting one. So if anybody on, uh, online feels uh, um, triggered to solve it, by all means, go for it. Uh, everybody will be eternally grateful, I'm sure. Um, okay, there is a, a large question from Juanan. Uh, so, sorry, uh, from uh, Harald Barsnes to Matthias and Juanan. Um, the question is, can you comment on how to deal with the potential changes resulting from reprocessing data compared to the original published findings? Is there not a risk that the reprocessed results can potentially even substantially differ from the manually curated or validated findings that were included in the original publication? And how should the field deal with this growing separation of data generation on the one hand and data interpretation? Sorry, Harold, you could have actually said that yourself, I suddenly realized. But then again, you like to talk, so why not? <laughs> uh, I can start, I guess, and then we can choose a try and ping pong, I guess, a bit, right? Um, a very interesting point. And, and we faced this particularly with Proteomics DB in the past, where um, we, um, for example, the Avidopsis um, um, proteome paper. Um, the analysis was done with MaxQuant and based on the MaxQuant results um, the figures for the paper were generated and then we incorporated the results into ProteomsDB but given that in ProteomsDB we have to do our own FDR estimation given that we want to make sure to the best of our possibility that we have a 1% across the database that certain things will be cut away. Right, So there is necessarily a difference between the analysis done on a single file or single experiment, right? Versus when you put this in con in light of a database um, collecting information from multiple resources, it feels like there is no way to do to 
to circumvent that, right? And we may just have to <clears throat> accept this to a certain degree, because the alternative approach is that we import everything in ProtimusDB, and we have done this for a recent mouse um, study, and then export the expression values from this and base the figures on this. But then technically, we are not allowed to import anything for mouse ever again, right? Because otherwise, we will risk kicking out proteins or peptides or adding new ones um, once we have additional identification or, or, or less confidence in some identifications, right? So it feels like, and again, one of these challenges where we are more clever um, um, brains may find a solution to um, it's, it's open open issues. Yeah, I mean, I think that that problem is difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult. So, I mean, to me, it's more, I mean, first of all, I think it's worth saying that this is not a problem unique to proteomics. I mean, there are other omics technologies, and especially, you know, the, the more kind of the less mature one omics technology is, there, there is more uh, a space for uh, getting different results when new software arises. So it just to really say that this is not a problem just for proteomics, it's for, for, for omics in general. <clears throat> and to me, the way to approach this is to be uh, transparent. So to say, uh, you know, we obtained these results uh, when we, we did the analysis this way. And this involves providing enough metadata, but also providing maybe even, you know, the exact version of the tool that was used in a in, in, in maybe in a container, something that uh, you know can be reproduced by others, and um, just also develop infrastructure that can really highlight the differences between the different versions of analysis, which in, indeed is very challenging already for uh, for 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 mass spec in, in general. So um, I don't know how to uh, deal with this from a kind of philosophical perspective. <laughs> Uh, because I guess that there are many different possible scenarios, but definitely I think one one way is to enable you know the community to make the decision. We shouldn't be making the decision ourselves, in a way. And and the way to enable this is to to be very transparent and to uh, and to enable you know reproducibility of the analysis and or at least that people have access to you know all the important pieces that. That need to be uh, considered when you know making a decision whether you know something is really novel or result of a, a reanalysis or, or not. I mean this. I mean th at least this is my take in on the problem, which I think is basically impossible to solve. <laughs> but uh, but maybe other people have other other points of view. <clears throat> yeah, I mean I agree. It's it's a big it's a big challenge for sure. Um, but I mean to the last part of my, my question in terms of separating this the generation of data now is is i mean the way it's been done in the past at least is you you generate your data you write publication based on data and then you you publish right but it seems to move to be more a trend that you now put the data into pride and then you look at the data in a bigger context in order to interpret the data so so how do we how do we deal with that because if a, if one data set is not enough anymore to un interpret the findings then I think shift, that, right? at least from my perspective, Harold, the people that are doing that is only, uh, but again, I could be wrong, so this is just my opinion, it's a small subset of the community as a whole. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> many people, they go from project to project, from publication to publication, because this is the way science works. You need, you need to get your PhD, you need to get a new publication, you need to get a new grant, you need to get a new project. And it's only a subset, I mean, many of the people that are in this, in this call, the, the really the, the people that can really uh, afford to go back to the data as a store and to you know and to uh, to 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 do new findings with it. I, I don't think it's the normal lab, in a way, the normal kind of uh, experimental lab that can afford to do this. So, so you, don't, you don't think there will be a requirement in the future to require bigger and bigger data sets because they are available. I mean, if you can have so maybe a, a maybe for a subs. And... I mean, maybe a, 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 you know a subs. The community will require that, but in my opinion, there will be others that they will not change the way of working. At least this is. I mean, at least substantially, because also the, their their lab is not built in this kind of expertise. If you want to have a lab that want to, they they need to be able to operate the latest mass spec. Plus all the separation, and you know all the, the the things that are needed to perform an optimal proteomics experiment. Plus uh, you know all this 
it's really very difficult to have that skill set in the same place. Um, but uh, again, this is again only my 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 point of view, Matthias. Maybe. So it, yeah, so I, I wouldn't not not I don't I don't have any sort of statistics on this, and I guess mm -hmm. that may be generated by by one, but it feels like that publishing a story which is just based off big numbers becomes more tricky these days, right? Because it's more of the same, right? In some way, so if we if we look at um, 30 other tissues of, of some other organism, right? It's the same again, right? It's nothing. So it feels like it's more, more difficult these days to just simply go for a large number than going to meet actually that the cool proteomics applications are the small ones investigating one particular problem and not go sort of in 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 sort of branch out a lot if, if that makes sense yeah okay it's probably a, big, it's probably a yeah. bigger discussion for some future time yeah i was going to say if this were a real meeting this is where i would advocate taking this discussion into the bar um unfortunately that might be a little bit difficult the three of you are a little bit far away from each other to uh, to find a, a convenient bar um however the next time we meet in person um uh, we can do that um and actually i have some very last slides about epic access before i send you all on your way uh, which offers you a potential opportunity to go to a bar um so let me just very quickly show you again the next epic access online webinar uh, will be about integrating proteomics and genomics technologies on Thursday, May 19. And um, you can go to the Epic Access website to register for that webinar, just like for this one. And then, of course, uh, the bar thing is the um, a live workshop on the 26th to 28th of September in Tartu, where again, you are very welcome and you can register on, uh, online on the Epic Access website. So with these two things reminded for you, I think we can uh, put a stop into this uh, webinar. Thank you all very, very much to the speakers for being here today. Thank you very, very much to the audience for being here. And uh, I look forward to encountering you either at one of the next Epic Access webinars and or in real life at one of the many meetings uh, that will hopefully spring up again um, in our field. So thank you all very much and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>